All right. If we could just have somebody open us in prayer, that would be fantastic. Amen. All right. So we're in the book of Judges and we're in chapter recording in progress. All right. Book of Judges, chapter 11, please. And we're going to read from verse 29 to the end of the chapter. And we're going to be looking at both Jephthah's vow and Jephthah's victory. And so verse 29, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he smote them from uh, from uh, Aror, e even till he came uh, to Minneth, even 20 cities onto the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man. And it was custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning, your time. Well, interesting chapter or section and of course this is the one that is the most controversial in fact many would say it's probably the most difficult portion to deal with in the entire book of judges and good and godly men of different theological persuasions differ on the interpretation of this passage and of course it all resolve, revolves around this thought did he or didn't he uh, did he actually offer his daughter as a human sacrifice, a burn offering upon the altar? Or was there some other way in which she was devoted to the Lord? And so that's really the big debate. And again, I have to confess that over the years, I have I've gone both ways uh, in my understanding of the passage, although I'm much more settled on it now than I was in the past. And I, I feel like um, I have clear view on it myself now so anyway you'll have to you may disagree with me but we can still be friends this is not an issue of fellowship it's not like how you say shibboleth either it's not one to divide the brethren over but anyway what we do know for sure is that scripture clearly forbids such a thing as the offering of one's offspring as a sacrifice to God. And the word of God is very clear. And we want to just look at the scriptures. And of course, this was often practiced, sadly, by even some of the kings of Israel, uh, but not in, in offering to Jehovah God, the God of the Bible, but actually to the idols of the nations, and particularly to Moloch, uh, the, the God Moloch. Often, it would be the case that 
Uh, people would put their children, their sons and daughters through the fire to Moloch. So let's just look at some references. Uh, first of all, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21, it says, thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. So again, very uh, specific, thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch. Uh, Deuteronomy, a couple of references in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 12, Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 31, thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods, for even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. And so God is uh, warning the nation as they go into the land not to be corrupted by the people of the land. And one of the things that uh, has been such a perhaps a reason, one of the reasons why God had destined the destruction of the Canaanites was because of the despicable practice they had developed where they would offer the, the, their sons and daughters as burnt in the fire to their gods, and particularly, as we've said, to Moloch. And then Deuteronomy 18, just to see that again and again, the word of God says, God has no desire for this, no a pleasure in this. Uh, it's something that's an abomination to him. Uh, chapter 18, verse 10, therefore shall, sorry, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. So all of these things were seen as utterly pagan practices that were completely contrary to the mind of God for his people, for the nation of Israel. Also, it, it seems to me, just as a kind of an aside here, that what we've learned about Jephthah up to now is that he was a man who had a, an incredible knowledge of the scriptures uh, and uh, his negotiations with the king of Ammon uh, showed his tremendous ability uh, to recall vast swathes of the Old Testament. So clearly this man was a man who knew his Bible. And so it just seems a very strange thing for him to do something that was clearly such an abomination to God. Hardly a fitting action for one whose scripture says in Hebrews 11 that he was one who the world was not worthy and also one who obtained a good report through faith. And so we, we perhaps should just look at that. Look at Hebrews 11. We're looking clearly that the scripture clearly forbids this action of offering uh, these burnt offerings of your children. And then Hebrews 11, just as we see what we can learn about this particular man, Hebrews 11, 32, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdom, so on and so forth. Now look at verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy, and then verse 39, and these all having obtained a good report through faith. And so this is why this passage is so difficult, because it's very clear from the word of God, God hates this thing of offering uh, human sacrifice. And secondly, on the other hand, this man is a man of the scriptures and clearly a man of faith. And so that's really a difficulty, isn't it? Did he do this or did he not do it? And then back in our passage, I want you to look, please, at verse 29. I want you to see something of the thought flow of the passage. It begins with this statement, verse 29, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. So this vow that he makes is basically, uh, at least as the way the text has it, immediately following the spirit of God coming upon him, which is interesting. Why is the text arranged in such a way that the vow comes immediately after this statement, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah? You would think the very opposite. If the spirit of the Lord came upon him, that he wouldn't make a rash vow. You see, so th these are some of the difficulties. By the way, this idea of the spirit of the Lord coming upon someone, uh, it, there are three of the judges that this is mentioned concerning. We've already seen uh, two of them. 
uh, in the book of Judges. Uh, we saw one in chapter 3 and verse 10, and that was when the Spirit came upon Othniel. I'll have to bear with me this morning because I have a small Bible with me uh, because the suitcase was so full of presents for the grandchildren that I didn't have to, enough room to put my own Bible in there, my normal Bible. So it might take me a bit longer to find my way around. <clears throat> Judges 3 verse 10, it says, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. This is Othniel. He judged Israel and went out to war and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, onto his hand and his hand prevailed against Cushan Rishathaim. And then we also saw in chapter 6, verse 34, another one of our judges, 6.34, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. So we have clearly this, this man is among these great worthies. He, he's linked with Othniel. He's linked with Gideon as one who the Spirit of the Lord came upon this man, Jephthah. And so it raises the question because it mentions that he, he, after the spirit of the Lord came upon him, he passes over Gilead, Manasseh, passed over Mizpah, Gilead, from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed over to the children of Ammon. So he's going straight to the battle after the spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And it says at that point, Jephthah vowed a vow to the Lord. So this vow comes really immediately after the spirit of God coming upon him. So we've got to determine, was it just a rash vow? Uh, and some would have us believe that. Some would suggest that uh, he's actually making a deal and a bargain with God. And basically what he's saying is, God, if, if you give me victory, uh, I am going to, in response to this, uh, I am going to offer whatever the first thing that comes out of my house. And so as we, we read the passage, it says, He vowed a vow, verse 30, 30 uh, unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands. So the, here's the kind of idea of the bargain. If you'll do this, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my uh, house to meet me when I return in peace. Now, again, is this is this kind of a, a man bargaining with God and basically saying to him, uh, look, if you do this, I'll do this. Or is it the spirit of God coming upon him? And with that comes faith and confidence because he does say, uh, when I come to my house in peace. And that's the language of faith. And of course, he's in the Hebrews 11. He's a man of faith. Like he knows that he's going to win the victory. And so is it a rash vow or is the arrangement of the text uh, really deliberate and showing us that this was really a man who is making a vow as he's moved by the Holy Spirit? And, and we think about, well, what, what is the idea of a vow? Usually a vow is when somebody uh, is enamored with God and wants to show some kind of act of devotion to the Lord. And so it's not usually a, a, a negative thing. Certainly we're warned about a rash vow. So we, we've got to try and de determine these things. Some would say that he's not really very spiritual at all, um, that uh, many have likened Jephthah uh, to some of the reformers who were certainly God's men for the hour. And, and certainly the spirit of God came upon them, but they weren't exactly the most spiritual individuals uh, around and and so uh, what would be cited as an example uh, would be men like Luther, who yes, tremendous courage, tremendous man of the hour, and God used him tremendously. And yet uh, Luther wrote things about the Jews that were just horrendous and certainly hardly spiritual. And uh, of course, many believe that Hitler basically just simply preached Luther, and that's uh, that was his doctrine. It was, uh, it was the anti-Semitic vitriol of Luther that came out of the mouth of Hitler. And so 
that's one thought that it is like one of these, like John Calvin, uh, again, this so-called great reformer, but he had a rival called Michael Zavetas, and he had him burnt at the stake uh, just with absolute cruelty and no mercy. And again, the, the, these reformers were interesting characters. Zwingli, another great reformer, God used him greatly, a man of the hour, uh, and yet he died in war against Roman Catholics. Uh, I don't know that that's the way we're supposed to uh, fight our warfare in the New Testament, right? But he perished with a sword fighting against Roman Catholics, leading his own flock into mortal combat. Not only uh, he was leading the, the whole congregation to fight Catholicism uh, and not with words, but with, uh, with literal swords. And so some have suggested that this is the kind of man Jephthah was. Uh, he's kind of like them. He's not particularly a spiritual man, and that he's making this rash vow, human manipulation, bargaining with God, not really a true vow, uh, but a bargain. Uh, if you will do this, then I'll do this. Another thought, though, is instead of this rash vow, it was a careful vow prompted by the Spirit of God. And even the phrase here, when he says whatsoever comes out, it could equally be translated whosoever comes out. Because whatsoever comes out of my door, uh, I mean, I'm not sure whether they kept family pets in those days. I doubt that they did, but uh, but it, it's very vague. Whatsoever comes out, like imagine a pet dog comes out, well, you, you know that's an abomination to God. And so some suggest that whosoever cometh out uh, will be given to the Lord as a burnt offering would be a far better rendering of this. Whosoever comes out will be given to the Lord as a burnt offering. Now, again, a burnt offering, uh, when we think of that, that word burnt offering, it li literally means that which ascends. Okay, that which ascends. That's the meaning of the word, that which ascends. Uh, it's an ola. Uh, and actually the word holocaust comes from it because of the smoke that ascends, that which ascends. And so something that is ascending to God, like a beautiful aroma, that's the idea. Again, the language, whatsoever comes forth out of the doors of my house to meet me. Now, certainly, I doubt that he would expect a typical burn offering to come out of the door of his house. I, I doubt that he kept his sheep and his cattle in his house okay and so whatever comes out that he says <clears throat> uh, shall i offer uh, to the lord as a burnt offering so <clears throat> again all i'm saying up to this point is there's great variation of opinion but one thing that troubles me a little bit is jephthah's knowledge of scripture would indicate he would know full well that any unclean sacrifice would be acceptable, unacceptable to God, and wouldn't be something you would bargain with God with. Why would God be even persuaded to give you victory if, if you were going to offer a sacrifice that was an abomination to him? Surely that would militate against God giving you victory, right? If it's something that is an abominable thing to God. And so it tells us in verse 32, we go from the vow to the battle. Now, what's amazing about this battle is how briefly it's dealt with. And then we go straight back to the vow again. So notice verse 32. It says, so Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them. And then it simply says this, the Lord delivered them into his hands and he smote them from Aror, even till he come to Minith, even 20 cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. If you just kind of put that together, the Lord delivered them into his hands, he smote them with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And so the details of the battle are kept to a minimum. All we're simply told is he smote them and then uh, with a very great slaughter, and they were brought into subjection. And so clearly, he was a deliverer. He, you know, these judges raised up by God to bring deliverance. Uh, the, the people of Ammon are going to come and attack. And he is a great savior 
and a hero of the people. But instead of dwelling on the victory and all the details of it, we don't get the how many uh, kind of groups he split the army into. You don't get any of the details like we do in other campaigns, just simply the fact that he won and we're brought back again to this vow. And so it says, and Jephthah came to Mizpah to his house and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels, and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. One thing about his daughter, it's very evident that they had a wonderful relationship. He, he only has one child, this one daughter, and there's, you can just tell from the text, there's great mutual love between the father and the son, uh, even down to how she responds uh, to the events and how he responds to the events uh, that transpire. So he's got this one daughter. She comes out. Obviously, the dancing, the timbrels is, is celebrating the victory. Her father has got a victory over Israel's enemies, and she's coming with celebration. And it says in verse 35, it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low. For thou art one of them that troubleth me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And so he's absolutely devastated when the daughter comes out to greet him. Completely surprised. Perhaps that's the last thing he anticipated, that she would be the first one to come out to greet him from the door. And so he's brought very, very low. Now, again, we, we want to just talk about vows just for a moment, because Scripture does have a lot to say about vowing vows and we we want to just kind of think about uh, the reason that vows are made uh, sometimes um, back in the book of numbers for instance we, we see that as a means of protection that if a daughter made a vow and her father heard it he could annul the vow he could he could say no, that vow is not acceptable. Or even if a wife made a vow, the husband could annul the vow. Uh, but <clears throat> and so it was. A, it was a, a definite means of protection uh, from uh, the wife or the daughter from doing something or making a vow that was considered to be rash or devastating in some way. So, but a man when he made a vow, he was bound to his word. By the way, it is imperative, isn't it, that we take vows seriously. I'm thinking of one vow that our Western culture does not take very seriously, and that's the wedding vow. Because when you get married, you, you stand before God, basically, and you make some very solemn declarations that include things like this, that you're going to be faithful and loyal to this person, through all kinds of circumstances, sickness and health and all, till death us do part. And I wonder how grieving is it to the Lord that that vow, even by his people, is being broken continually in our culture. And it's a very serious thing. And, a very, and I do believe in, in premarital counseling, one of the things that needs to be spoken about is the solemnity of a vow, what you are committing to and the importance of standing by your words. And so it's very important to keep your word. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes for a moment, just a couple of interesting scriptures that concerning vowing. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse two, it says, be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. And then verse five, he says, better it is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. And so, again, vowing is a very important thing. Uh, it, it has great significance. And so why do, would people even make a vow? Well, usually it's because they're so enriched that 
to, to in a sense, show their, their appreciation of God enriching them in some way, they would make a vow to show their gratitude uh, in a special way to God. Or again, when you, when you get married, right? Part of it is that God has brought to you this life partner and you're so enriched that you want to make this vow in the presence of God and say that you're going to stick by this person until your dying day. But of course, if <clears throat> the vow has devastating consequences, like in this case, poor old Jephthah is devastated when his daughter comes out and basically is saying, look what you've done to me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you brought me very low. Uh, you brought me to a devastating place. And of course, she really uh, had, in a sense, brought him to a devastating place. So notice verse 37, it says, and she said unto her father, and again, this is where I mentioned how much she loved the father. She said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down. No, I'm sorry, verse 36. Verse 36, she said unto him, my father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And so you see how compliant she is, how willing she is to allow her father to do what he's promised. And she recognizes what God has done in giving this victory. And the Lord has taken vengeance for thee amongst thine enemies. And so, again, we get something of this love relationship she has with her father. She just she respects him. She loves him. She's willing to be compliant to what he has vowed. And so now we come down to the nitty gritty. Verse 37 to verse 40 are very key verses in understanding this. She said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And here's where I'm, I'm beginning to wonder, is it something different than just being offered as a burnt sacrifice on an altar? Why would she just bewail her virginity rather than bewailing the fact that her life is about to be taken from her? Right. To me, it would it would be much more sensible if you're going to be offered as a burnt sacrifice on an altar uh, to to bewail the fact that her life is cut short in its prime. But no, she's bewailing her virginity. I and my fellows. Now, verse 38, he said, go. And he sent her away for two months and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And again, the stress on bewailing her virginity. Verse 39, it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. Now, again, those that take a strong view of the fact that he did offer her as a human sacrifice would say that this little section here, where it says, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, would indicate that he basically built an altar, he laid her on the altar, he slit her throat, and he burned her body. That would be the plain understanding of that text. We certainly can see in from chapter 12 that Jephthah no, has no difficulty in, in killing his own people, <laughs> but Again, it's in, in, in the context of a civil war in chapter 12. It's not as a sacrifice to God. Uh, so it's a very different setting. So, again, the strongest argument of those that believe he killed her was who did according to the vow which he had vowed. But if we look at the wider context, again, notice what it says next in verse 39. He did with her according to his vow which he had vowed, and she knew no man right again it seems to be linked with this bewailing of virginity bewailing of virginity and she knew no man now once you say think well who did with her according to his vow which he had vowed and then he burnt her on the altar but don't say that it says she knew no man and it was custom in israel now notice verse 40 that the daughters of israel went yearly 
to lament the daughter of Jephthah. Now, I don't know about your Bible. My Bible has a marginal note here. And for the word to lament, it, it literally says, the daughters of Israel went yearly to talk with her, with the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. And so under to lament, it says to talk with, to converse with, to sympathize with the daughter of Jephthah from year to year. And so it would seem to me that what Jephthah did was that he had made this vow that he would offer whatever came out of his house or whosoever came out of his house. And I believe that he was going to offer them as a temple servant who would be fully devoted to the Lord for the whole of their life. And so perhaps thinking that it would be one of his servants that would come out and showing his devotion to the Lord, he would offer that servant to serve the Lord as a temple servant at the door of the tabernacle for the remainder of uh, his or her life. And then when it came out that it was his daughter, then, of course, that troubled him greatly because he has no heir whatsoever, no dynasty, nobody to follow on in his lineage. And so, of course, it's devastating to that hope that he would ever have a, an heir because she would be devoted to the Lord all the days of her life. Now, let's just think a little bit for a moment about this idea of people doing this. Do you remember Hannah? We've already dealt with Hannah. And what did she do? She said, Lord, if you give me a man, I'll give him to you all the days of his life. And what did he do? Well, he ministered in the tabernacle, didn't he? Remember trimming the lamps and all this kind of stuff? He ministered in the tabernacle. And it seems like people did this, uh, both in the Old and New Testaments. We have people who are devoted all the days of their life to temple service or tabernacle service. As Exodus 38, verse 8, it says, He made the labor of brass and the foot of it of brass of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And so it seems like women assembled there, somehow looking for opportunities to serve in any way that they could. Uh, First Samuel, uh, interesting verse in chapter 2 and verse 2, where we read about those wicked sons of Eli that we have dealt with in previous studies. But we also notice in First Samuel 2, in verse 22, it says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now let's go to a New Testament context and look at the Gospel of Luke for a moment. In chapter 2, Luke chapter 2 and verses 36 through 38. One of many of our favorite characters in the New Testament era is this lady, Hannah. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 36. It says, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she cometh into the, in, in that instant to give thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And so it would seem that there were people who were devoted to temple service, and that's what they would do. It was kind of like a lifelong kind of a Nazarite type vow where they would vow to serve the Lord all their days at the door of the tabernacle. Sometimes it was women like Anna, as an example, or the other women that are mentioned. Uh, sometimes it could be men like Samuel. And that's what they would do. And I believe that that is exactly what he did with his daughter. Now, the difference is that most of the women that 
were there at the door, perhaps were older women like Anna, perhaps widows, who in their widowhood devoted themselves to divine service. But the difference here with Jep Jephthah's daughter is that she was young and she had never had the privilege of marriage or having children and all the rest of it. And so she's bewailing a virginity, bewailing a virginity. She knew no man, no man. And it says the daughters of Israel went yearly to talk with the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite, and I believe to console her that because of a vow, this was her chosen life. And so that's maybe some of you don't agree with me, but I think the alternative, just I, my difficulty is that one thing that the Lord had no desire for these human sacrifices, except for one, <laughs> only one sacrifice was in the mind of God. And that was the redeeming sacrifice of his son, the Lord Jesus, who would die on Calvary's cross. But no other human sacrifice. In fact, it was an abomination to God. It was something that he absolutely hated uh, with a great hatred. And a man who knew the Bible, like Jephthah, it would seem unconscionable for me that he would do that and still make it into Hebrews 11. Now, I realize that some of the folks in Hebrews 11... Uh, you know, they didn't always behave themselves. We're going to see our next major judge, Samson, certainly wasn't the most uh, well-behaved judge on the planet, for sure. But it would seem to me, anyway, very unlikely, uh, particularly something so heinous as a human sacrifice. And so I believe that's an alternative view that at least seems satisfying to my mind, especially with the wider context of this obsession in the passage with her bewailing her virginity. It would seem to me that she'd been devoted to God as, yes, something that would be, something would ascend. Uh, you know, her devotion, both to the Lord and to her father, I think would ascend beautifully to the presence of God for the rest of her days. So that nicely takes us into chapter 12. And we we'll come up with these guys, once again, these men of Ephraim. And we, we've met them before, and they, they're people that are very awkward characters. Uh, we met them in chapter 8. If you remember, after they always seem to show up after a victory has been won. And they always seem to be upset that they weren't the center of the battle. And so we saw them in chapter 8 with Gideon. Remember how Gideon had the difficulty of pacifying his difficult brethren, and so if you look at chapter 8, we'll just remind ourselves of these men of Ephraim. The men of Ephraim said to him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest us not, when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God hath delivered into your hands, the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. And so they were, well, I, would, I would call the men of Ephraim touchy brethren, soon touchy, <laughs> touchy brethren. They're always ready to complain and always feel like they're being left out. Now, Gideon knew how to, to somehow placate them and calm them down, and he took that very lowly place and won a victory over them. But then in chapter 10, we find that there was another humble judge that was somehow, even though he wasn't from Ephraim, was, was able to kind of keep them pacified for 23 years, and that was Tola. And if you notice again in chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, and after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pur, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel 20 and 3 years and died and was buried in Shamir. And we pointed out how marvelous it was that he'd managed to keep the Ephraimite, even though he wasn't one, to keep the Ephraimites quiet for that whole period of 23 years. And we marveled at, at again, 
perhaps his humility and calmness of spirit enabled him to uh, keep these people who are always spoiling for a fight uh, kind of calm and peaceful. But now we get to chapter 12, and notice it says, here they are again, the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said to Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. So <laughs> these very touchy brethren now feel like, again, they've been left out. They're not getting the glory of the battle. And so they're so mad uh, that they weren't sent to stage that they decide that they're going to burn down his house <clears throat> upon him with fire. They're, they're adopting early Philistine tactics. If you look at chapter 14, chapter 14 of Judges and verse 15, you'll see this is kind of how the Philistines act. It came to pass on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Have you called us to take that we have? Is it not so? And so they're acting like the Philistines. Threatening to burn his house down. And again, what's the root of all this? Well, again, I believe it's, it's envy. There are always those who resent anyone else accomplishing anything or gaining any victory without including or recognizing them as well. They're what I would call begrudges. They begrudge success to anyone if they're not the center of it. <laughs> and again, behind all this is that old problem of pride. Remember, only by pride comes contention. And we saw from Gideon, the key way to deal with them is to take a humble place, right? That's how you overcome that, that lowly place. Uh, and yet, <clears throat> obviously, Jephthah is not kind of <laughs> that kind of man. Uh, and so <clears throat> he reacts in a very different way. And often the key is how do we react to such people? Do we fly off the handle in retaliation? Or do we take a lowly place and a place that seeks to conciliate and to make peace? Well, we find that Jephthah said to them, and now no, I want you to notice before I read verses two and three, I want you to pay attention to the personal pronouns in verses two and three. Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon when I called you. You delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that you delivered me not, <clears throat> I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come to me, unto me this day to fight against me? So again, notice the dominance of I, me, and my in these this section 11 times 12 if you include the one in italics in two verses there's i me and my reminds you of romans chapter 7 remember romans chapter 7 in that one chapter 49 times i me my and myself and so even though the spirit of the lord came upon him now self is dominating not the spirit of the lord He's dominated by self. And the result of this self-domination and self-vindication. And so you, you basically now you've, you've got two, you know, you've got Ephraim who want to be sent to stage. They're selfish too. They feel like they're not in the center of the battle. And now self responds to self. And what's the result? Well, you notice verse six. Here's the result. Then said they unto him, say now Shibboleth, and he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passage of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. 
And so as a result of self-dominating the people of God, 42,000 people lose their lives. Can you see how devastating the self-life can really be? And so we see it here, brethren fighting against brethren, civil war of amazing magnitude, 42,000 Ephraimites killed. And, and again, it's just interesting that although Judges is not strictly chronological, because there's another civil war we've got to come across in this book, and that's when the 11 tribes virtually wipe out Benjamin. And actually, in terms of time, chronologically, that is an earlier incident. But as far as the flow of this book, this is the first instance of civil war, although the war with the Benjamites actually occurred before it. But again, tremendous devastation. And what's behind it all? Proverbs 16.10. We've said it over and over again, haven't we? Only by pride comes contention. And so this this chapter is just laced with it pride goes before destruction scripture tells us proverbs 16 let's just look at that it's very important for us to, to see this book of proverbs chapter 16 verse 18 and 19 Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. And so again, pride goeth before destruction. And tragically, how destructive and devastating spiritual pride is. Humility fosters unity and peace amongst the saints pride always brings this dissension and division only by pride so we're told first peter 5 verse 6 humble yourself before the mighty hand of god and that's that's what we need to do this is so important to understand this principle and so back in chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hand. Now, what's interesting is that he basically says to them that I did call you. They're accusing him of not calling them to the battle. But he says, actually, I did. And what's interesting is they don't, they don't in any way deny it. There's no denial on their part, even though their accusation at the first is, why passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, didst not call us to go with thee? And he says, when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. And so they were busy fighting the battle, was, was uh, Jephthah and his troops, and Ephraim, even though they'd been called, didn't come to the battle. But now the battle is won. They kind of feel like, why were we left out? Well, they were left out because they refused the call. They didn't come. They missed out on the opportunity of routing the enemy. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people were a great strife with the children of Ammon. When I called, you delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that you delivered me not, I put my life in my hands passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come unto me this day to fight against me? And so he says, we were busy fighting a battle to be too worried about you oversensitive brethren. We called you, but you didn't come. Although you did not come, I risked my life in the battle. And because God delivered them into my hands, to fight against me, you're really fighting against God because he won the battle. And so it's filled with these personal pronouns. There's just a lot of self going on in this chapter. And yet, tragically, in one sense, these people, maybe he should have tried a soft answer. And that might well have turned away wrath. But instead, he kind of fights fire with fire. And the result, as we're going to see, is devastation that is going to come upon all of the people. But we're going to save that 
God willing for next time as we're five after. So we're going to stop right there. <laughs>